So our next speaker is Jorge Zavala, who's going to tell us about constraints on the dust obscured star formation up to the epoch of realization. Okay, um, can you see my presentation? We can and we can hear you. Cool. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to, to thank the organizer for doing this meeting and also for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, this result. This, uh, this is a work that we have done as part of the COSMOS collaboration. And we are going to present basically some constraints or estimation of the dust obscure star formation rate density up to redshift 6, 6.5, which is close to the epoch of rayonization. So yeah, let's start with the cosmic history of star formation. So in this plot, we have um, two different kinds of measurements of this quantity. One in illustrated here in blue comes from UV, an optical observation, which traces the unobscured component of the star formation. So these measurements are actually, we have good constraint up to redshift of eight, and we have some measurements up to um, redshift of around 10. On the other hand, we have the constraint that comes from far infrared and submillimeter and millimeter observation, which traces the, the dust obscure component of the star formation. Uh, in this case, we have good measurements of this quantity up to a redshift of around two, which is close to the peak of the cosmic star formation rate density. And beyond redshift two or maybe redshift three, we have like just incomplete measurements of this quantity or very highly uncertain um, estimation. And beyond redshift five, we have basically no constraints on the dust obscure star formation rate density. Um, so the main goal of this work is to constrain the dust obscure component of the star formation rate density, at least up to at redshift of, of six. Um, one thing that we, I, we need to highlight is that the current data or the current, current constraint cannot distinguish between these two different extreme scenarios. So in, in one scenario, we have this, uh, this line here, which illustrates a, a, a universe in which dusty galaxies basically do not contribute significantly above redshift of four. So basically the star formation rate density is dominated by, by the unobscure component. But on the other hand, we have this other scenario in which dusty galaxies dominate the star formation rate density, even up to a redshift of six. And there have been some works in the literature that suggest that the, the universe could be either of these two, two different scenarios. So the current data cannot distinguish between these two very extreme uh, scenarios. So this is the goal of, of, of this work is basically using all the observation at far infrared and submillimeter and millimeter uh, wavelengths, and particularly in this case, the number counts uh, to constrain the infrared luminosity function. And, and with this constrain the dust obscure star formation rate density. So we are going to use the number counts as, as a constraint and we are going to use a, a backward evolution model uh, to do this, this constraint. So I'm going to describe uh, just briefly how, how the, the model works and how, how we infer these constraints on the dust obscure star formation rate density. So basically we start with an infrared, infrared galaxy luminosity function, which looks like this, uh, this sketch. The infrared galaxy luminosity function is actually well constrained up to redshift two or three, but beyond redshift of three, we have like no good measurements of this, of this quantity. So, we use the, the infrared luminosity function that are well constrained below redshift three. And then beyond, beyond redshift of three, we just, ex, we just explore different evolutionary model for the infrared luminosity function. So once we have a, a, a model for the infrared luminosity function and its evolution, we, we combine this with, the, with a library of a spectral energy distribution. Um, this is just basically for the dust emission of the galaxies. And our SCDs follow this relation, which is the dust temperature uh, relates with the luminosity of galaxies. So with these two components, we have, we can uh, explore how many galaxies we have as a function of luminosity, as a function of redshift. And we can estimate the flux densities at different wavelengths using the, the SCDs. So with combining these two quantities, we can create fake observation or fake maps 
at different wavelengths. This is just an illustration of three different wavelengths at three, three different maps at three different observations. And then we can combine these fake maps with a beam size so we can we can try to mimic the, the real observation and we can add noise to, to our fake maps to our fake maps just to reproduce uh, uh, real observation. So this, these are just some example of, of the result of, of this model, which these are fake observation that resemble the real observation, real, real telescope surveys. So once we have this fake observation or simulated observation, we can extract the sources from these maps and then measure, for example, the number counts in, this ma in these maps and compare the number counts to the real number counts in the observation. So this is an example in which in orange, we have the number count from the model and in gray, we have the real number count from a real observation. And we can see that the model do not reproduce well the, there is a dis discrepancy between the model and, and the observation in this particular in this regime. So we can go back to our model and now change the evolution of the infraluminosity function at high redshift and repeat again all the process and then we can get a different number counts. And in this case, the number counts fit, fit the data. So in this way, we can use this statistical measurement, this is the number counts, to constrain the infrared galaxy luminosity function. So we have done this, and these are just prediction from the model for the number counts at different wavelengths. These are two, two extreme scenarios. In one case, the in blue, we have prediction for the dust poor universe in which basically dusty star forming galaxies do not contribute significantly above uh, at redshift of four. And in orange, we have prediction for a model in which dusty galaxies dominate the, the total star formation rate density, even up to a redshift of six or seven. So as we can see in the first two row, the prediction from the two, from the two different scenarios are basically the same at short wavelengths. And this is because the infrared luminosity function at low redshift for the two models is the same. Just the infrared luminosity function is different just at high redshift. And since at short wavelengths, most of the galaxies are low redshift galaxies, the prediction are basically the same. And we can see that the model prediction are different for, for long wavelength observation, particularly one millimeter and two millimeter. So basically the conclusion for this test is that long wavelength observation, particularly longer than one millimeter are, are ideal to constrain the infraluminosity function at high redshift. So this is one of the reasons of why we propose to do this ALMA blind survey. This is the MORA survey, which is the first ALMA blind map uh, at a wavelength of two millimeter. And as, as we can see, it's a relatively large map compared to other ALMA surveys. This is one, 185 square arc minute of observation at two millimeter. And here as a comparison, I just, I'm showing just other ALMA maps. So we have, we did this in ALMA cycle six, and this is just, these are just some examples of the sources that we have detected. We have a sample of 13 sources above, a, above five sigma. We have some spectroscopy redshift for some of them. For example, we have this galaxy already 5.8. And basically all the galaxies that we have detected are above a redshift of two. So we have used this sample of galaxies and we have built the number counts at two millimeter. And then we have used these two millimeter number counts to constrain our model and the infraluminosity function in our model. So the two millimeter number counts are here in the middle, but we have also used the 1.2 millimeter number count from the ASPEC survey, which is also a very deep ALMA survey. And also we have used a three millimeter number count from, from this paper that I published like two years ago in combination with the ASPEC results at three millimeter. So we have three different number counts at, at, wave, at, at long wavelengths. And we have used this number count as a constraint for our model, which I just, I, described uh, before. And basically the prediction or the best fit model that better reproduce the number count simultaneously are these gray line, lines. So we can see that the model does a, a very good job at reproducing these three number counts simultaneously. And the model also reproduces the number counts at shorter wavelength. These are just some example of 250 micron, 500 micron and 850 micron. 
So now with these number counts, we have a well-constrained model. So we have a relatively well-constrained infrared luminosity function. And now we can just integrate the infrared luminosity function across redshift and derive the star formation rate density, or at least the dust obscure component of the star formation rate density. So the prediction of our model or the constraints for, from this model are illustrated in this orange region. Um, there is of course like a, the peak is a redshift tour which is between two and 2.5. And then the dust obscure star formation rate density declines at high redshift quite significantly. And here just as a comparison, these are just results from the literature. So we can also break down this star formation rate density in luminosities. And we can see that most, most of the star formation rate density of this dust obscure star formation rate density come from Lurk and Euler galaxies, which are relatively massive and bright galaxies, which is in contrast, in contrast to the UV optical unobscure star formation rate density, which in which a large fraction of, of these come from, from faint galaxies. So here we have relatively massive and bright galaxies dominating the star formation rate density. So we can also plot on top the, the constraint from the UV optical surveys. And we can see that the dust obscure and the unobscure component basically have a comparable contribution between redshift four and five. So we can divide this or just make the ratio between these two quantities and estimate the fraction of obscuration in the, in the star formation rate density. And we can see that the dust obscure star formation rate density basically has dominated the, the, star forma the, the cosmic history of a star formation up to redshift four. Uh, I mean, there are some uncertainties in this measurement, but beyond redshift four or, well, let's say beyond redshift five, the dust obscure star formation rate density is most likely not the, the most dominant component here. And beyond redshift six, basically the dust obscure star formation it only contributes around 20% of, of the total cosmic star formation rate density. So with this, we have kind of a complete picture of the cosmic history of star formation from redshift zero to redshift 6.5, which is uh, quite a high redshift for this, for this measurement, particularly for the dust obscure component of the star formation rate density. And I think my time is up, so I just finish here. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jorge. So there's a few questions just coming in here. So Tom Toons asks, could you include AGN in the modeling? Would that make a difference to your conclusion? Uh, yeah, basically in, in the model, we have no AGN here basically because we are just trying to reproduce the, the, the star formation, gal I mean, just the, 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 the mission of the galaxy that comes from the, from the star forming region. Uh, and we know that for, a, for the number counts at A50 microns are, are, and longer wavelengths, most of the galaxies are dominated by star forming galaxies. And the AGN contribution is like a minor fraction. Uh, we could probably introduce AGN, but uh, this will this this will probably change the number counts and prediction from our model. And now then the number counts agree with the data basically for for all the the wavelengths. So if we introduce AGN, we probably will have some disagreements uh, with our model and and the data. Thanks, that's great. Um, Mark Dickinson asks, on your slide, from the infrared luminosity function to the cosmic star formation density, um, at redshift four to six, what are those measurements? Okay, yeah, I mean, for the, for the infrared, uh, the infrared data points, I don't have all the reference here, but basically come from the Madau compilation plus new measurement from, um, McNelly, et al., Kaprowski, um, Williams. I mean, I don't remember all the reference. And the blue, the blue region come from Fink Finkelstein 2015 paper, which is also the UV measurement that, that we adopt. 
Um, but basically, it's the Madao compilation for both the, the IR and the UV plus new measurement from the literature. I can I can give you the the full reference uh, offline. Okay, and I think just time for one more question from uh, Roderick Overzaya. Um, what fraction of the infrared obscured star formation is accounted for by correcting the um, reading and correcting the UV measurements? So I guess if you applied the the kind of beta IRX calibration, um, what fraction of that of that star formation do you recover? Yeah, I mean I haven't done particularly that specific calculation. But here, the, the UV measurement that I'm plotting here, these are not correcting for dust. And, and we can have the, just like a, an idea of the fraction of obscuration, but for the total star formation based on this top panel. Um, but I have not done the calculation specifically uh, for what would be the correction that we will need to do in for the UV in order to match the total star formation rate density. But I can also uh, chat offline about that.